So a question, have you ever had a tradie look at your house or a mechanic look at your car and they say something like, you should really get that looked at. <laughs> they notice something on your house or your car and they say, you should probably get that looked at. At the time, we know that they're right, but being the good Kiwi people that we are, we put it off and we think, she'll be right, <laughs> she'll be right. That, overlooked, uh, that overworked cam belt will do another 1,000 Ks. That $25 as seen on TV repair tape that I slapped on the roof will do another winter. So we think to ourselves. But when it all turns to custard, we realize our mistake. We've stubbornly refused the wise help of others. And we find ourselves in trouble because we fail to give attention to important details. We find ourselves in trouble because we fail to give attention to the things that really matter. There is a very old proverb that says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. This is Belshazzar's story. He grew up in a time when the conversion and faith of his father, or more accurately, his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, would have been common knowledge. <coughs> this is something that his parents may have talked about at the dinner table. This is something that his teachers may have mentioned in the school classroom. But Belshazzar ignored his grandfather's conversion and testimony, opting for a foolish life apart from God. And the consequences are catastrophic. So we begin by reacquainting ourselves with a few important details that brings us to this text. Last week we remembered or recounted the dramatic conversion, the account of Nebuchadnezzar's conversion and faith in God. But in the next chapter, chapter 5, all of a sudden Nebuchadnezzar is no longer on the scene. Over 20 years have passed. Nebuchadnezzar has died and a successor has taken his place. And that named successor is Belshazzar. That is who succeeded Nebuchadnezzar to the throne. But just to quickly get this out of the way, I know that the text claims that Nebuchadnezzar was actually Belshazzar's father. But historical records do show us that actually Belshazzar um, was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, that Nebuchadnezzar was the grandfather of Belshazzar. This is not a mistake in the biblical text. The Bible is not an error to record it this way. Rather, it is a well-known custom of many ancient texts. In fact, John Calvin picked up on this, and he said, Daniel calls Nebuchadnezzar the father of Belshazzar, since it is usual in all languages to speak of ancestors as father. That is, it is a known custom to refer to some of our ancestors in closer proximity than what is actually true of the family tree. Sometimes in cultures, people refer to their ancestors simply as their fathers, right? Even though they may be much further removed in the family tree. In any case, chapter 5 is very, very different from the previous chapters. It just is. Previous chapters gave us a long account, a very long <coughs> account of Nebuchadnezzar's lengthy process or progress toward true faith. The, the, all the chapters before us, this long lead up to Nebuchadnezzar finally coming to true faith in God. But chapter 5 is a sudden jolt and a change of pace in the narrative. It just, it's short, but not sweet. It's just short in terms of telling us who Belshazzar was. It tells us about the quick reckoning of a king entrenched in a foolish life apart from God. Indeed, the whole chapter, all of chapter 5, takes place on a single evening on the very last sunset of the Babylonian Empire. The very last time that they would see a sunset over the Babylonian Empire. The whole chapter takes place that 
single evening. So it really is quite a jolt in the pace, isn't it? It really is quite a jolt in the narrative. But why? Why crash everything to a halt like this? And what lesson might we gain from this? May I suggest to you that in good measure, chapter 5 is a cautionary tale against foolish complacency toward God. And it invites us to consider a wiser path. Chapter 5 would be a cautionary tale to us not to be complacent toward God and to choose a wiser path. To appreciate this lesson, let's think about some of the important details that we find in the chapter. Details which contrast Nebuchadnezzar's faith in God and Belshazzar's, uh, Belshazzar's contempt for God. So there are these two contrasts. There's Nebuchadnezzar and his true faith in God, and there's his grandson, Belshazzar, who had contempt for God. They are contrasted kings for us. And first among the contrasts is found in the way that chapter 4 ended and the way that chapter 5 begins. Remember, after years and years, Nebuchadnezzar humbly came to faith, and at the end of chapter 4, he said, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Now think about the way that the very next verse begins, chapter 5. A playboy king who made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Those are two very different kings, are they not? The one praising God the other drinking himself stupid. And because we know the way that the chapter ends, the way that Jesus read it for us, we do know what the end of the chapter actually brings. It's important for us to take stock of the situation at hand. The chapter ends with that decisive military capture of the Babylonian capital. Meaning that Babylon's enemies must have been within striking distance on the very night that Belshazzar decides to have a booze up. They are right there. They are just over the hill. You could probably see their encampments if you were up on the watchtowers. The enemy is right at hand and the king decides to drink. Indeed, this is exactly the record from, the, from one ancient historian, from um, Many, uh, several hundred years BC, one historian recounts that evening and he says, When Darius the Mede heard that a certain festival had come round in Babylon, during which all Babylon was accustomed to drink and revel all night long, he, that's Darius, took a large number of men just as soon as it was dark and took the city. Just as the Bible says it happened, is how ancient historians record for us, is how it actually happened. It is a true account of what happened that evening. Unlike his mighty grandfather, Belshazzar would rather party than protect the empire from an imminent threat. He is a very different king from his grandfather. But there's more. It's not just that Belshazzar had it penchant for partying. That's not the only thing that makes him a foolish king. The text also focuses in on his blasphemy. The text tells us about his blaspheming. He reveled in belittling God. He reveled in belittling God. You see this in verse 2. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought 
that the kings and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. In much younger and far more foolish years, friends and I used to talk about our beer mugs as our vessels. We'd arrive on Friday nights to one another's houses and we would say something like, choose your vessel. Choose your vessel. It was a way of identifying whose possession the mug is in, who possesses that particular mug or vessel. And Belshazzar is doing something very similar here. He is signaling to one and all that the sacred vessels of the Old Testament church were now his possession. The possessions of the Old Testament church are now his possession. He drinks from it. It is his to do with as he pleases. And in that action, in claiming that the vessels belong to him and not to God, he is signaling in that action how little regard he has for God. I'll just drink from your holy vessels as I see fit and when I see fit. It shows how little regard he had for anything true and good and holy in life. In his mind, it is that holy things ought to serve him rather than be used in service to God. Keep in mind, this profane use of temple vessels was intentional. It wasn't that he opened up the cupboard space in, the, in, in, the, in Babylonian pantries and found some vessels sitting there that would make good drinking vessels. No, he chose these vessels quite intentionally. He wanted these vessels specifically. We know that because he even names their origin. He knows exactly where they came from. He knew full well that these vessels came from the temple in Jerusalem. He, will, he knew full well he was, in a manner of speaking, taunting the God that his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar praised. He was taunting that God. And it appears his stance of derision and contempt for God had become ingrained upon his character. It was ingrained. It was so much part of him to have contempt and derision for God that you couldn't see if he was just putting it on for an evening or whether this is how he always acted. And it would seem that this is the way that he always acted by now. He was always being a fool. This is likely why we're not given a lengthy account of Belshazzar's life like we were of Nebuchadnezzar. With Nebuchadnezzar, we see these kind of swings in and out of, you know, do I, want, do I have an interest in God or do I not? Do I, um, do I honor the people of God? Do I not? He has these ins and outs. But Belshazzar has nothing of that. He has only one way of operating in his life, and that is to be foolish. There is only the foolish account of his life. He is always being foolish. He has an unwavering and immovable contempt for God. To this foolish path of hostility, God is now giving his verdict in the text. If, if, this is, if this is how your character has formed over several decades, if this, is, if this is how it's going to be, if this is the concreted setting of your life, this is now the verdict that the Lord gives to Belshazzar. You see it there in verses 5 to 6. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote, then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. I 
old cartoons I used to watch would have characters knocking their knees together. But it was a joke, right? It was a way to give an expression to a, a scaredy cat, as it were. This is not comedic. He is so terrified, his body is shaking. And there is no one able to help him understand the writing on the wall. Except for a long, overlooked, civil servant, Daniel. A servant who, so, who served his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. No one can help him but this one servant that he has overlooked for nearly 20 years, but who faithfully served his grandfather. That is the only man that can help him in this moment. And since we've talked about contrast this morning, contrasting Belshazzar with Nebuchadnezzar, we have to keep in mind that Daniel comes into the picture as another contrast to Belshazzar as well. You see it there in verse 11. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, the Chaldeans, and astrologers. It tells us that, uh, that Daniel was wise, but Belshazzar was not. Daniel is the one that the text calls wise, filled with wisdom. But equally, it keeps telling us what a fool Belshazzar really was. See how the queen mother pointed it out. Your father, your father the king. Remember how wise your father, your father the king was. He recognized and honored Daniel's wisdom. But you do not. You couldn't find wisdom if it landed on your nose. Look, I don't know any easy way to say this. Though our God is long-suffering, patient, merciful, and kind, there really does come a point at which our arrogance, pride, and our hostility toward him become so much a part of who we really are. We become so set in our ways. We arrive at an irreversible complacency toward God that God simply hands us over to that kind of life along with its consequences of judgment. We become so hostile to him that God simply lets us go. Another disquieting passage of scripture speaks to this. For although they knew God, this is speaking of humanity in general, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Therefore God gave them up and the lusts of their hearts. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and God gave them up. By all the evidence of chapter 5, Belshazzar did not honor God as God or give thanks to God. And so this moment of being handed over to the consequences of a life foolishly lived apart from God has arrived. The moment has come. And perhaps even in a last ditch effort to pull Belshazzar from the brink of his own destruction, 
Daniel revisits his, how his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar came to faith. Daniel is before Belshazzar and he reminds him, remember your father, your father, the king. Remember how he humbled himself and came to faith in God. Remember how good that story is. Daniel reminds Belshazzar that though his grandfather was a competent and greatly feared man, when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets it over whom he will. You just imagine the setting that, that night. Belshazzar, Daniel, companions. The great story of your empire has been summarized of Nebuchadnezzar who built this great empire and how he in the end of his life was humbled by God and then expressed his faith in God. And as Belshazzar listens to that account, that fresh recollection of the golden years of the empire, you're almost begging for him to take the hint, aren't you? Belshazzar, your father, your father, the king. He was once proud like you are being. But he turned to the Lord and found a wiser path in the end. I suppose in that way, Daniel is asking Belshazzar, look, you too, you have lived all these years so proudly, but you too can be remembered like Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of the empire. You could be remembered as a man, a king, who humbled himself and found a wiser path toward the end of your life. That softening of his heart does not come. Even now in the final minutes of his life, Daniel is aware and he declares, You, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Though you knew all this, but you lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know but the God in whose hands is your breath and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. You have drunk from his vessels, but you don't honor him. And even here, had Belshazzar been a humbler man, he's invited to own his sins that Daniel has just named. He's invited to own them, to repent and to trust God for future obedience and faith. But nothing, not even this last ditch appeal, not even this last minute plea for him to change would dissuade Belshazzar's mind. He is who he is. Nothing will change him. In his mind, he is king and God is not. He runs the show. God does not. And we're asking, what would God say about a person so entrenched, so given over to foolish hostility toward him? How would God assess that kind of life? 
that will not and does not even want to change. How would God assess that life? What would he say of it? He tells us in three Aramaic words, interpreted, numbered, weighed, and divided. And you see them there in verse 25. This is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is God's verdict upon Belshazzar's foolish life. And it's telling. The verdict is telling. Numbered, of course, means that Belshazzar's time is up. Weighed, meaning Belshazzar had been found to be a hollow man. Lacking in any kind of moral or spiritual substance. And finally, divided, meaning that the great Babylonian Empire, for all her past fame and dominion, had now, been come, had now come to be parceled off to the Medes and the Persians. And this uncertain fulfillment of Nebuchadnezzar's own vision of the future, recorded in chapter 2, where Daniel interprets a dream and says, Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you and swallow you up another kingdom will arise and that has now that is now on the horizon babylon has come to an end the age the age of the medes and the persians have come This is God's verdict and judgment upon a man who lived a foolish life of unrestrained contempt for God. And just to drive home to you that this certainly is an immovable contempt for God. Even here on the precipice of his death and even as he hears the divine verdict pronounced he defies God just one more time. The God who rules the kingdom of mankind and sits over it whom he will. Belshazzar would defy that God just one last time. He insists. He insists that even if this kingdom is taken from me, I will choose my own successor. God will not set this kingdom in the hands of whomever he wills. Belshazzar will set it in whomever hands he will. Verse 29, Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler of, in the kingdom. Just one last stab at the Lord. This is a very hard chapter to preach on because the lessons are so plain and so pointed. They are also urgent. When faced with the true reality that it is God that we are dealing with in life. And it is to him that we must give an account. She'll be right simply will not do. Our attitudes of she'll be right and being complacent and thinking that we can put things off. Will not do. It didn't work for Belshazzar in this in this chapter and we would be equally foolish to think that complacency toward God would work for us. As Sinclair Ferguson rightly said, it is a reminder that we dare not presume upon the grace that God has shown to others. To know that God is gracious and yet not turn from sin in the light of that grace is to fall under his righteous judgment. 
But throughout the text, there is wisdom to be found. It's not that everything is negative in the text. There is wisdom for us to be found, a wiser path for us to discover. There is a God. That much is sure. And this God welcomes all who come to him in humility. That much is sure also. But Belshazzar is shown to be a foolish man rejecting the wisdom offered to him. He would, not, uh, he would not heed the wisdom of his God-fearing grandfather, and he would not heed the wisdom offered to him by Daniel. In this, in biblical terms, is a foolish way to go about life. To keep rejecting the wise, the wise counsel of others, of the men of God, of the people who know God in your life, to keep on putting off their wisdom and to not take heed is a foolish way to go about life. As the ancient proverb says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. <coughs> Here then is the final question to us also. Are we resembling the wise person who heeds the testimonies of God and are learning to trust him, including trusting him with our salvation through Christ? Or are we still plodding along in a foolish life, doing what seems right to us in our own eyes, while remaining complacent and even contemptuous toward God? I can't answer that question for you. But I will leave that question with you because it is a question that we would all do well to answer. Let me pray for us.